I wasn't scheduled to sing tonight, but I wanted to share this song with you for several reasons. One, I want to thank you as a church for welcoming my mom. Uh, I left it up to her tonight whether we came back, and the minute I asked her, she said, yes, sir, that she was ready to go. So that kind of tickled me. That means that you've made an impression on her, and for that, I thank you dearly. I also want to share with you a couple other things that's happened since she's been here. A couple people have come to me and said, Jay, if you and Beverly need a break, let me know. I'll be glad to come sit with your mom. That means a lot. You know, for people to step forward and do that, if you're close with somebody and you see that kind of need, and you know, as I sit here and I'm, I'm moved to tears, I, um, I think about Nola Chamberlain with Tex, how when we started our family care ministry, how she came to me and said she wanted to spend time with Tex. Could I put her on her list for uh, the care, care group? Here? And uh, it just touched me there. I'm going to sing a song tonight. It's new. Um, you probably, you might have heard it before if you listen to Southern Gospel. It's called Look for Me at Jesus' Feet. I want you to listen to the words in it. I might get a little teary-eyed in it. If you hear my voice start quivering, that's because the message that's in this is pretty clear about we're all going to face death one day. And uh, being my mother's here, I may go before her or she may go for me, but look for us at Jesus' feet. If I leave this world to some sorrow Oh 
How about a hearty amen? amen? That's some good, good singing. Well, we're glad you're here tonight. I want to remind everybody that uh, every Sunday morning, we're going to be talking about putting the church on fire. Leave your matches home. <laughs> and tonight we'll start our doctrinal study on the deity of Christ. And then Wednesday, this Wednesday, I'm going to be Zachariah. But guess what? We start our meals back again. Everybody say yum, yum. What do we have in Deb? Whoa. Like it. Ooh. Woo. Everybody say yum, yum. We should have it tonight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, that's going to be this Wednesday, and I'm going to finish up the book of Zechariah. If you haven't been here, I'll give a quick review. Excellent book. We've had a wonderful time. And then the following Wednesday, we'll be in Matthew for the next several months, uh, verse by verse study. And then uh, the ladies' night out, I think there's a very big crowd going. How many? 29. Man, put, they're all Sheila's going. That's what I, if you're an outbacker. All righty. Yes, ma'am. Hey, turn the spotlights on high. Uh, they're blinking. Either that or they're winking at me. Make sure it's all the way up, the, uh, the pulpit lights. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought you just said amen. Everybody say, out back. <laughs> and then the ladies' Bible study. Miss Judith, raise your hand. If you haven't signed up, you can do that tonight. Uh, Children of Light. And then uh, next Sunday night, right after I preach, we'll go over there. And everybody say, happy birthday. We're going to have lots and lots of fun, so keep it as a matter of prayer. Ava, uh, Elvis, now his wife was a famous uh, singer too. Posey, and what song did she sing? I'm a woman. Wow. So anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun, plus uh, root beer floats and all that kind of stuff, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, it's okay to have fun. All righty. And then our Sanctity of Life Sunday on the 18th. Uh, I think it was last year. Miss Elsie and I were down on the road. Uh, we'll be doing that again if you want to join us. Uh, we hold up signs and telling people to beep their horns. And I want to tell you, in this community, most people are behind life. And I know I am. And then uh, the following week, our time of... Uh, Gideon's, and then our revival. I want to tell you, you look this guy up. Write his name down if you got a pen. Frank Shelton. By the way, right in front of you, some of our uh, northern folks, there is a pen inside your uh, pew right there. You can take those pens, uh, those northerners, because those are special for you. Uh, we've given everybody else those. And uh, But anyway, write his name down. Google him. You'll be amazed at some of the uh, great things this man has done. And then we have two meetings uh, on the... Uh, Tuesday, our property and space at 7. Thursday, our deacons meeting. And don't forget Wednesday. I think I said enough. Okay. Let's stand together as we have our offertory. Well, before you stand, you can uh, sit for just a minute. Uh, Debbie, I wish you had not given us the menu for Wednesday because I'm not going to be here this week. <laughs> That's why it's so and mac and cheese and all of that. Uh, I will be in Orlando for a music conference. Uh, so please uh, postpone it. <laughs> uh, secondly, on the uh, uh, board in the hallway, I have the, we have the schedule, the new schedule for all of the special music. Those of you who are soloists, if you uh, uh, haven't checked that, it's for the next four months, so make sure you check it. Unfortunately, it's all filled up, so I didn't have room for Dan or for Joe, <laughs> but maybe in the, later on in the spring we can fit you in. I doubt it, though. But <laughs> the hymn that I picked out for the offertory, uh, every Sunday afternoon I have an opportunity to listen on the radio to one of the great preachers of the past, one of my favorites, J. Vernon McGee. Yeah. And he's been with the Lord for many years now, but he was the pastor of the Open Door Church in downtown Los Angeles for many years. And all of his sermons are recorded. And uh, so they're on radio every Sunday afternoon on the station I get. And <coughs> this hymn reminds me of what he mentioned. He mentioned, I must tell Jesus. 
I think it's a great hymn for a new year. We've got to be open and tell Jesus everything. And if we do, he will speak to us, not only through his word, but if we just simply listen and let God, I must tell Jesus. Number 455, and let's stand together and sing. Number 455. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. On the third, tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, her cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me. Over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this evening that you've given us to come and to break the word of life. And Father, as Kevin shares the word tonight, I pray that each one of us will open our hearts and our minds.
Let's hear from Brother Jim. All right. I want to do this song tonight uh, for a very special person, a dear friend, a student of mine, uh, a good Christian brother in this church. And I want all of you to remember, just remember, he always sat where Kathy Davis is sitting. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. But this was his favorite song, and I wanted to do it tonight in memory of Bud Dawson. This was his favorite song, and when I would be giving him a lesson, I'd ask him every time he came over, Bud, what song would you like to learn most of all? He said, Fallen Leaves. <laughs> that was his favorite song. So I'm going to do that for him. Falling leaves that lie scattered on the ground, the birds and flowers that were there now aren't around. All his friends that he once knew have not around, they are scattered. Like the leaves upon the ground Some folks hunt their blue life And never thrill To the feelings That the good deed brings until It's too late And they are ready to lie down beneath the leaves there that are scattered on the ground Lord let my eyes see every need of every man let me stop and all this and a helping hand then when I'm laid beneath that mossy ground, there'll be leaves upon the ground. To your grave, there's no use in taking gold. It's no use. Time for hands to fold when you leave this world that someday the only thing you take is what you gave away, the only thing you take is what. You gave away. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody says amen. amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the first chapter in the book of uh, Hebrews first chapter in the book of Hebrews. That'll be our text tonight. But I need some Bible scholars. Those are really the good-looking people. Miss Judith, if you would, Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 4, double duty tonight. 
Miss Linda, would you read for me uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7? Somebody else. Thank you, Miss Lee. 2 Timothy 3 and 4. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll just go with that right there. Uh, everybody say doctrines. When, when we're talking here, is this on? I think it is. There we go. When we're talking, go ahead and turn the pulpit mic off and just turn this up a little bit if you would. There's nothing more important than doctrinal studies because what we see happening in the world, and you see it, unfortunately, on television, uh, the, the, the churches that are growing are two-sided. Two Many of them are Pentecostal based on feelings or emotions and uh, uh, health and wealth, health and wealth. Every sermon I flip through the channel, health and wealth. Uh, give your seed and you'll become a millionaire. By the way, giving your seed works. But God never promises anybody wealth. In fact, the only reason he gives you a seed is so that you can plant it and give it back to him. The other side of that is an emerging church, and it's a more youthful church, and it's a church based on more, uh, and I'm not criticizing contemporary music, but it's based on that, but it's more of a concert feel instead of a church feel. In fact, they even call sometimes what they're doing a concert, and, and the sermon is added on. We flip-flop so that the music, instead of enhancing the preaching, the preaching is kind of an added on after the music. And the concert is important. I saw this out in California where my uh, mother, stepmother, attended. Uh, they had a two-hour service. An hour and 15 minutes of that was music. And it was tremendous. No kids. All the kids were sent down. They didn't have Sunday school. They didn't have Bible study. They had a two-hour service from 10 to 12. And, and I will say the pastor preached for about 45 minutes to an hour, which I'm going to do tonight. <laughs> Very funny, preacher. <laughs> uh, but, but in that time, it was more about things that are very important. How to be a good father, how, how to invest our monies, uh, how to read the Bible, uh, how to uh, have personal devotions. All those things are important, but they're not doctrines. And, and what, what we need to do in the church, it, it's sort of like trying to start a fire without wood. The doctrines of the Bible is what is going to be the foundation, the rock-solid foundation of which the church is built upon. Uh, the, the doctrines is going to be the, uh, the structure that, the built, that is built upon. May I say to you, many of these churches, as soon as disaster occurs, as soon as difficulties occur, they'll fall like a house of cards because they're not built on what? Let's read some scriptures just before we get to our text tonight, and I hope you have your trifold with you. But let me, let me give you out these scriptures, and I want you to read them out as loud as you can. Ephesians 1, 1 and 2. He's calling these people saints, and the reason for that, look in chapter 4 and verse 14. It says here, these, everybody say saints are not tossed to and fro, not, to, not be when the winds come, where, which way are the winds going? May I say to you, let me get a little political, it's the same thing in politics today. Uh, we have a president that wants to go with whatever is popular at the time instead of doing what's right. And sometimes doing what's right is not popular, ask Noah that fact. Many times in our society that we're living today, in fact, the scripture that we're going to share, so he says here, doctrine grows us from children to adults. Secondly, Colossians 2 and verse 7. Having been firmly rooted and now been built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So you're established. Everybody say established. established. 
by the doctrines. One more, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Everybody say doctrine. doctrine. Chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 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 1 through 4, and this will be it uh, in our introduction. May we have our benediction and go home. The scripture has spoken. Again, in these two groups, the more emotional group, cast away with the winds of, of whatever is popular, and then here, whatever feels good. Whatever feels good. And, and by the way, those, it's like eating candy on a regular basis. Uh, those things are, uh, will be uh, malice to us, will become disastrous to us, because we need holy Doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. Well, you're there in uh, Hebrews and chapter uh, 1. I want to read with you, if I could, verses 1 through 4. Are you with me? God. Just want to stop there for a minute. Who in sundry times and in divers manners spake uh, in times past unto the Father by his prophets. Has in these what days? That means from the time of Christ to where we are today, has in these last days spoken to us by his what? Capital S. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, by who? purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Father, bless our teaching and our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Number one, what do we read here? We read that Jesus is who? Now let me just differentiate just for a moment the difference. There are many today who call themselves Christians. Call themselves Christians. I, I had some relatives who were uh, brought up in the Catholic faith and, and they seem to understand a little bit of, uh, uh, of knowing God and accepting Christ. Many Catholics are saved. They're just very immature Christians. But many of my relatives said this, oh, so-and-so died. It's a shame, but he believed in God. He believed in God. And, and, and it's kind of hard and it's kind of difficult to say. Believing in God is not enough. The Bible says, everybody say who? The Bible says the devil believes and trembles. Not only do you not just believe in God, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we're looking here tonight, the reason I'm beginning with the letter, go back there, deity of Christ, on the, if you see the outline there, the word doctrine, the deity of Christ is the most important doctrine there is. Without it, we are without hope. Without it, we have no salvation. There isn't any reason for this being here or anything that we see. Everybody say Jesus. The other side of this uh, uh, supposed Christians, are Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, Mormons, <laughs> they just believe Jesus was a, 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 an angel or a, just a good guy like Joseph Smith, a prophet. He was not part of the Trinity. In fact, they believe the only God there was was Adam. Adam was God. He was a Mormon from another planet who came here because he was a good Mormon and he had two spirit children, Jesus and Lucifer. Lucifer became the father of all the black people. I don't know how that gets across today, but it's in their doctrine. But in that time, that Jesus wasn't who he is. There is no trinity. 
There is no God. In fact, the only purpose is, your purpose in life is to become a God in another planet if you're a good Mormon. Everybody say, that ain't right. <laughs> the second part of that is Jehovah's Witnesses. And Jehovah's Witnesses are knocking on doors and telling everybody they're a Christian. By the way, I don't understand it, how they don't believe in having birthdays, they don't believe in, in Christmas. I love having a Jehovah's Witness and going over there and saying, Merry Christmas! <laughs> By the way, Jehovah's Witnesses give their kids gifts. They just kind of give them to them. It's not Christmas, they just give them gifts. But here's what they believe. They believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. There's only one God and his name is Jehovah, thus Jehovah's Witnesses. And they don't believe in a Trinitarian belief. Everybody say, that ain't right. Now, if we're talking here about doctrines, the doctrines that we believe as Baptists and as evangelical Christians, number one, Jesus is God. Write it down. Number two, and by the way, we read why we believe in that. The Bible says, everybody say, Bible says. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Why did they want to kill him? Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he even calling God his own father, making himself what? Jesus didn't die because he was teaching or healing or raising from the dead. He died because he said, I am God. Number two. Oh, I don't, let me, I'm going to go through these. Well, these are great verses. Too bad you can't read them. Well, I, I do want to go back here. I, I did some research. You know, we talk about um, religions. Uh, in the year 108, in the early church fathers, this is what he said. To the church which he was a pastor there, is at Ephesus, united and elected through the true passion by the will of the Father, and Jesus Christ are what? Wow. One more. Polycarp, writing in the year 110, 130, a disciple of John uh, the uh, Apostle, uh, to all under heaven who shall believe in our Lord and God, who? You ever hear about being a martyr? It comes from the name Justin Martyr, who died in 165, one of the great beginning of the outpouring of uh, killing Christians. The father of all the universe has a son who also, what? All right. And uh, we read here, number, uh, number one, he is also called God. We read in Hebrews chapter 1, but if you look down there, he said, your throne, everybody say, oh God. What, what, what did Thomas say to Jesus? My Lord and my what? Now, I, I, you have to talk to a Jehovah's Witness. Do you, do you believe in the Apostle Thomas? Yes. He didn't say, my Lord and my angel. He didn't say, my Lord and my brother of Satan. He said, my Lord and my what? So not only is he God, but he was called God. And the reason they crucified him was that the believers called him God. Now listen, listen. Not only that, but Paul would have never been beheaded. Peter would have never been crucified upside down. All the other 11 apostles who died a martyr's death, one was filleted, their skin was peeled off of them. One was put on a pole and impaled. One who was uh, shot with arrows. And, and of course, John, the revelator, who was dipped in paraffin, set on fire, but didn't die, he kept preaching, was exiled to Pasmos. None of those men would have been hurt just because they believed in Jesus. The Roman, the Latin idea of many gods was fine. In fact, in the Pantheon, which is now a church, they have our little, little grottos around. There's a hole in the middle. Birds fly in this gigantic arena. And when you're there, there's a god to uh, Mars and a god to Jupiter, a god to Saturn and all the other planets. And when the sun comes in during those months of January and February, each one of those gets a certain time. It was a great marvelous thing. This is what the emperor offered Paul. We'll set up a God for him. And Paul said, there is no other name given amongst men where we must be saved but Jesus. They killed the apostles. They killed Paul, not just because they believed in Jesus, but they believed only in Jesus. There was no other way and I had a deacon in my last church, loved him to death, loved him to death, one of the best deacons I served with, but I couldn't believe when he said to me once, he said, I have, he was a delivery man, he said, I had this dear, dear friend, 
who died, and I was going to go to his funeral. I'm going to say a few words. And he said, can you give me a couple of scriptures? And he said, make sure that they're the Old Testament. And I said, why? And he said, well, the man's a Jew. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, oh, he's going to heaven. He's a Jew. And I said, excuse me? He said, well, you know, being Jewish, you still go to heaven. I said, if you're a saved Jew, why do you think Paul went and preached to the Jew first and also to the Greek? You're not saved because you're a Jew. You're not saved because even people call you a Christian. You're saved if you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you. Everybody say, I believe that. And number two, he has the characteristics of God. We saw him here. Jesus always existed, Jehovah's Witnesses. He always existed. In fact, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is Jesus. In the beginning, God, everybody say Jesus. John 1, 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word dwelt among us. He always existed. He didn't come about in A.D. Uh, 4. He came about always. He was the fire, one walking in the fiery furnace. He was the one standing next to Daniel in the lion's den. He was the one on the burning bush. Jesus always existed. Oh, I'm going to get excited. Jesus is omniscient. He said to Zacchaeus, I know your name. Oh, I like that. He knew his name. There was a Roman soldier that came to him, Jarius, and he said, I know your daughter, and she's not going to die. She's going to live. Everybody say, he knew it. He knew everything. He even told Peter and John, go to this house on the way. And there, there's a cult there. Just tell them it's me, and they'll give it to you, and I'm going to ride upon it. They got there, and man, there was the cult. Everybody said he knew. Omnipresent. Now, here's a difference. Many that are Buddhist or Hindu or the New Age movement, this is what they say. I believe in Jesus. God is everywhere. God is in everything. No. God is everywhere. But he's not in everything. He created everything. And he created it for his glory. There's a separate. You have to separate God from his creation. God is everywhere, but he's not in everything. He holds everything by the power of his might. He created it and sustained it. Let me get a little scientific here tonight. Everything you see in this room, the microphone, even the sound that I speak, because it is making air and moving the air along. The lights in this room, the windows, the glass, the pews, everything you see in this room is made up of 106 elements. That's all. And configurations of all those. There are uh, molecules and uh, compounds that make everything you see. 106, that's it. The Bible says he spoke everything into creation. Let there be, let there be, let there be. And at the end, he speaks it out of creation. It's enough! Everything turns back into 106 elements. Let me tell you, he is the holder and sustainer of this world. And then he's omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. There isn't anything God can't do. He's greater than cancer. He's greater than your difficulties. He's greater than your family problems. Many times we say, oh, I don't know what else to do. I guess I'll pray. And the answer is, God can do anything. He is the healer, the sustainer. He is all, not all powerful. Now, wait a minute. You ever see the sunrise? That's the God is my Savior. <laughs> if he can make the sun rise and the glory of that color, can he not provide for me? Can he not heal me? He's omnipotent. Oh, I've got to stop. And then immutable. Everybody say immutable unchangeable, unchangeable God. Oh, I love that song. Unchangeable, unchangeable God. Listen, God doesn't change. Worlds change. People change. God doesn't change. You know what else doesn't change? His doctrines do not change. We believe in an old-fashioned religion. And as soon as you say old-fashioned, it seems to have a negative connotation in our world today. I don't know. Air is old, and I believe in it. The water's old, and I believe in it. Gravity's old, and we wouldn't be here without it. 
there are some things that we better get back to what's old and what we're established on and what is important in life. And everybody say, you better move on, preacher. I'm only on number two. Now, here's the word. He is human. Write it down. He is 100% divine nature and 100% human. This is what we call the God-man Jesus. Everybody say God-man. I don't understand that. Okay, you're not God. Jesus wasn't just a man. He was a God-man. Oh, we can see the importance, we'll see in a minute, of the virgin birth in this. He, he, he became pure because he wasn't tinged by the sins of Joseph passed on by his father. He circumvented the sin nature. Everybody say it was perfect. Say it again. His blood was pure. His father was God. Now somebody said, how did that occur? Now let me tell you what the Mormons believe. Mormon believe that Adam, God, came into the room and had sex with Mary. Yes, that's what they believe. And, and in fact, married Mary, as one, because Mormons can have many wives, and in heaven today, Mary is Adam's hundredth wife or whatever wife number she is, and gave spirit children to that. Well, when we see the... the now, you're going to say, oh, I don't... Believe. They're growing leaps and bounds. Listen to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I'm enthralled by their music. This past Christmas, they did a Christmas special, second to none. But then you say to yourself, what's happening today? Seducing spirits, doctrines of devil, leading people away. Even through beauty and majesty and music, leading people away astray. We are not moved by music. We're not moved by tech, uh, technology. We're not moved by emotions. We're moved by doctrines. Doctrines. Music is beautiful when it's based on doctrine. Technology is beautiful. It's be used, being used tonight to broadcast my voice when it's based on doctrine. Uh, everybody say the God-man. Now here's what we read, number two, the God-man. The Word became what? We call this Emmanuel. God is what? With us. Mm. The doctrines that behind that, seminaries spend entire decades studying that one fact. May I say to you, isn't it funny that the mainline denominations, many of them today are debating this very issue, who is Jesus? Many of them do not believe that he is God. More and more are denying the deity. Everybody say that word deity. That's what we believe, the deity of Christ. Do not believe the deity of Christ. There are Southern Baptist pastors who call themselves pastors who do not believe in the deity of Christ. I don't know what they're doing. They don't believe in the doctrines of God. Many in the mainline denominations have moved away from it. They said it's not important. Well, what is important? Helping your fellow man. Being kind one to another. All those things sound good like the Mormon music. But it is a deceiving devil leading away from doctrines of devils. Number, oh, three, <laughs> number three. He is virgin born. Jesus was conceived supernaturally. Pastor, can you tell me how it was done? Yes. Let it be. It was very difficult for God. Somebody said, you know, that's in <laughs> so I love these. I love these people who have all these degrees, and I have more degrees than them. But I love some of them that have all these degrees, and they said, it is physically impossible for a virgin woman to, to be born. But it's not possible for this planet to just be floating in the middle of the universe. Hmm. It, it, it's not impossible for this planet to be traveling at 2,400 miles an hour around and we don't spin off. It's not impossible that when you look out into the universe, you can't see the end of it. You mean it's not impossible that we can't count to a number other than infinity, and we're surrounded by things we don't understand, but you pick the virgin birth as the thing that you really can't understand. Let me say, if God can make the world, sustain the world, and make, keep the world running, I think he can make a virgin birth. There was a purpose in the virgin birth, and that is to bypass the sin nature through Joseph. How was it done? Through the what? 
Holy Spirit. In our redemption, there is the Trinity. Now again, there are many groups. I remember being on my first Holy Land trip, and there was a group of Pentecostal. Uh, they're very big, big in the mid, uh, Midwest, so some of you might have heard of them. They're called Jesus Only, Pentecostal. Here's what they believe. In the Old Testament, God was God the Father. When Jesus was alive, he was God the Son. And at Pentecost, he became God the Holy Spirit. And speaking in tongues is evidence that you have uh, the Spirit. And when I spoke to them, I said, well, that's fine, but that's heresy. Well, I didn't make friends and influence people. But I couldn't believe our Jewish tour guide, we went to the Church of the Nativity, which, by the way, is the oldest church in Christendom. Uh, it's a very plain building, quite large, uh, maybe the size of a football field. But over, over to the right, as you come in, there is a baptismal font. Now, you would think, and the Catholics would tell you, that they only, you know, trickle or, or sprinkle, but it's a baptismal, you have to climb in it. And on the side of the baptismal font, which is uh, t almost uh, 1,950 years old, uh, there is a mosaic of how you baptize. And the teacher, the tour guide said, since all Christians are Trinitarian, it says on the side they would dip one for the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son, and I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. They would be baptized in the name of all three. The one guy turned around, he said, that's a lie! And the, the Jewish tour guide said, buddy, I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says. I couldn't believe it. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says. Oh, everybody else laughed. And I went over to him, I said, I told you so. I mean, it's there. But when we even talk about who Jesus is, and at his baptism, we see the Trinity. What we believe as Christians, and we'll hear this in a few weeks, we believe in a triune God. Everybody say triune. Deep theology. And then we believe in his work. There are three of them. We believe in his work as prophet, write it down, priest, and king. His work falls into three categories. Jesus came as a prophet to tell people to prepare for the end of the world. He said it. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said, not many days hence, the world will come to an end. Jesus said, when he was in Matthew chapter 24, when will these things be? He said, when you see these things occurring, my time is coming and my time is at hand. Everybody say a prophet. He came as a priest when he died on the cross he took his blood to the throne of God and offered his blood as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. That's what they were doing in the Old Testament for almost a thousand years. They were offering the high priest, everybody say priest, would come in on the day of Passover and offer the blood for the covering of their sins. Jesus said, I came as a priest and offered my blood, not as a covering of your sins, but a washing of your sin away forever. Everybody say number three. Not only was he a prophet, not only was he a priest, but he was a king. The Roman government knew it because they put on the top of his cross, Jesus, king of the Jews. The Roman soldiers knew it. They platted a crown of thorns and gave him a scepter in his hand and a royal robe upon his back. They knew who he was. And so did the Jews one week early that came and said, Hosanna to the king. Jesus came and fulfilled all three parts of his work. Everybody say, that's who he is. Then, what did he do? He paid the debt. The wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And then, the three words from the cross. Everybody say, gospel. When somebody comes to you and says, well, that's the gospel truth, they don't know the gospel truth. You're not saved just because you're in church. You're not saved because you prayed a little prayer. This is how a person is saved. By the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Everybody say, that's the gospel. Paul preached it. Peter died for it. The martyrs of the Christians in the Fox's Book of Martyrs would all tell you the same. That has not changed. You're not saved because God picked you, Calvinist. 
You're not saved because you're in some kind of celestial uh, pool that your name was chosen. You're saved because you believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Say, that's it. Then what three things were accomplished? I love this. When Jesus died, this is Romans, by the way, chapters 1 through 5. The Bible says, everybody say Bible said, He paid the ransom for my sins. I remember as a child, we used to save those S&H green stamps. My mother would have me come over and stick my tongue out. It was better than a sponge, you know. Then I'd talk like this. Okay, Mom, can I use some of the S&H green stamps? And we would go down and we would redeem those uh, uh, booklets. Well, when God came, we were at enmity, at war with God. Our sin separated us like the two sides of the sanctuary. Jesus came and said, what is the cost to bring these two together? The cost was his blood. And Jesus said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. What do we believe? We believe that he atoned. I want you to see this word atonement, at one mint. Here's what we do. Jesus came and made us one with God. I don't think we ever understand that. In fact, Brother Jim, we're going to be in eternity for eons we're never going to understand. We become part of God's family. As Jay sang in his song and his beautiful leaves of the song that Jim is, when we get to heaven, we inherit all of that because God made us one with him. Do we deserve it? Do we earn it? It's a gift, but it has to be received and when it's received, we become Christians. And then reconciliation, that's a big word. We, Jesus came and made peace because we were at war with God. We have ambassadors, and Jesus is our ambassador. Not only did he do it in the past, but the Bible says, everybody say who? That he daily makes intercession for us. He is our advocate reconciling us to God. Here's what the devil says. Whoa, 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 look what he did. Whoa, 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 look what she did. And Jesus is over there saying, for those sins I paid. For those sins. Because when I became a Christian, God paid my past sins, my present sins, and all my future sins. I am saved for eternity because of reconciliation. Everybody say amen. I should have put one more word down, and that is the word I love to use, imputed. Say it with me. That means that God shoves it into us, imputes it into us, his righteousness. I am a saint, not because of what I do, but because of who I am. I am a saint, not because of my, merry, my many merits. I am a saint because God lives in me. I'm a saint, and I live for him every day of my life. Number four, he redeemed us with his what? Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. i got to be quick. I see a few people looking at their watches. <laughs> you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. He atoned us with his burial. Now listen, let me go back here. He redeemed us with his what? That's the first word. Everybody say redeemed. redeemed. Then he atoned us, that was that second word, with his burial. The Bible says, by which we'll, we are sanctified through the offering of the what? So we're redeemed by his blood, we're atoned by his burial, and we are reconciled by his death. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the what? Through the what? Death, burial, resurrection. Each one of those had a part in who Jesus is and what we needed. Everybody say, he's perfect. Whew. Unchangeable God. And then Jesus came to be crowned king. But instead of that, they put a crown of thorns upon his head. But my friends, there's coming a day when Jesus is going to return and claim his kingdom, and he's going to come as king of kings and lord of lords. Everybody say, I believe that. He was born a king. Everybody say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, we love to sing those songs. He was given gifts that you would give to a king. 
He lived a royal life. Born a king. Oh, by the way, we read in the scriptures, everybody say the Bible. Where is the one who has been born? What? <laughs> Number two, his kingdom was rejected. John 1.11 says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. His kingdom was rejected, and the time and the clock stopped for his kingdom. That's why Jesus said, thy kingdom what? Not now, but come, because you rejected him. Not only did you reject him, but you crucified him. And by the very thing that you did, because of Satan, God used it to redeem our souls for eternity. Everybody said only God could do it. And then thirdly, Jesus claimed to be king. Jesus answered Pilate, You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world. Everybody said he claimed it. He born it. It's written about it. He lived it. And he claimed it king. And then lastly, Jesus will return as king of kings. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. On his robe and on his thigh, he had this name written. What? King of kings and Lord of lords. What do we know about his second coming? He will return from heaven, number one, a what? Everybody say Advent. 2,000 years ago, it was the first Advent, and we celebrate that Advent season at Christmas. But there's coming a second Advent, a second coming of Jesus Christ. Everybody say, I believe that. One third of Christians today do not. One third of Christians do not. There was a time when the majority of Southern Baptists did not believe that 200 years ago. It was not part of their doctrine. They believed that we were bringing in the kingdom, establishing the kingdom. Now we know that this world is not our home. And a millennial kingdom is to come and it will be established when Jesus does his what advent? Second advent. Jesus' return is coming soon. The Bible says, So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come, and when he does, you will not expect him. He comes as a thief in the what? He'll come when we least expect it. Now, I remember back in the 70s when I was early Christian, there was Thief in the Night movies. Everybody was talking about it. The church seems to be silent in it. Pentecostal church is silent. The emerging contemporary church is silent. Oh, are we forgetting the importance of that doctrine? May I say to you, I think it's all part of Scripture. Can anybody with their right mind see what is happening in the Middle East and not realize that he's coming? Everybody say he's coming. I must be quick. He will come as a thief in the night. When it least expect it, he will come. But, Brother Jim... He's not a surprise to us. <laughs> He's only supposed to be a surprise uh, to the world. You see, when we see these things coming, the economic instability that everybody's worried about, I'm not worried. This, the Bible says, my God shall provide all of my needs. The Bible says, he gives me my daily bread. We're going to be all right, friends. Everybody say, we're going to be all right. We got each other. Worst case scenario, Christians got the living together and taking care of one another and be like the early church. Listen, we're going to take care of each other. This world is not our home. Secondly, we look around. There's an evangelistic fervor that is happening around the world. My, the Bible says, when the gospel is preached to the whole world, I'm coming. It's being done through satellite today. But there's eroded faith, and that's what makes me preach this series of sermon an elevation of an antichrist spirit. Why is it that everybody's very sensitive of not offending Muslims, but it's okay to offend Christians? Everybody said, that ain't right. All right. Don't you love my English tonight? Endless wars. I, you know, we talk about World War II, four years, four and a half years. We've been in Iraq for like a dozen years. It's like the song that never ends. Because we don't know how to end the war. You bomb them, get rid of them, and rebuild. But we don't know. 
I'm not running for president. <laughs> Earthquakes and disasters. Here's the plan. First comes destruction, and secondly comes his kingdom. The Bible says when Jesus comes, he will come and speak a word, and all that we know will disappear. And then God will come and rebuild. The question is, are you waiting, are you watching, and are you working for the Lord? Everybody say, I got it. What do we believe? We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Now you know, and you're better for it. May we stand together in prayer. Everybody say, I got it. Father, we leave here filled with wisdom from God's word. We will not be swayed by health and wealth. We will not be swayed by feelings and emotions. Our faith is based on the word of God. We are people of the book. Our strength and foundation is the doctrines of what we believe. We will preach them. We will die for them. We will stand upon them, though the world shake and crumble. The doctrines of God is our hope, our anchor, the word of God and its truth. And Father, may we proclaim it to the end of the days. Thank you for illuminating us tonight through your word. In Jesus' name, amen.